Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. Happy Thanksgiving! On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk about the importance of honeybees in agriculture, as well as some hot topics, including Bayer's multi-billion dollar balancing act, new research about how neonicotinoid pesticides are linked to dramatic decline in UK butterfly populations, and efforts in Quebec, Canada to impose strict regulations on pesticides. So first, I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Happy Thanksgiving, Tom. Well, happy Thanksgiving to you too, June. Many listeners write to us and are intrigued by what Tom is experiencing as far as bee losses. So, Tom, can you please give us an update? How are things going? Well, things aren't going too well, June, actually. Uh, My situation is a little different in that I never had thousands of colonies. I didn't take my bees to the almonds in the winter and I was what I I called a community beekeeper. My bee yards were within about 15 miles of my home, a local territory. Um, Effectively, I farmed and ranched the bulk of the county, the eastern part of the county. I was a community beekeeper. I supplied primarily a local market with high quality table honey. And uh, at uh, at my peak during the the better years, I might produce several tons of high quality table honey every year, and had a loyal following of customers now, many of whom have been with me for almost four decades. And I faced the same problems that the commercial beekeepers have in that uh, my losses have been enormous and I haven't been able to replace them and completely every year and as a consequence I've just been slowly now in the last three or four years more rapidly sliding downhill and uh, I have to, it's as I've said before, it's embarrassing to talk about this because it represents a failure on my part to continue as a successful beekeeper, and and I don't particularly like talking about it. But I'm about done for. I'm uh, I'm about to become one of the casualties. Well, Tom, you're very humble. I think it's important to just point something out. While you may not be what most people think of as commercial beekeepers, a migratory beekeeper. And basically, for those of you that don't know what that means, is migratory beekeepers travel, and they actually go to very remote areas. They spend a lot of time out in the fields. It's it's not a very social-type job. And Tom's business, as he pointed out, it's more community, but the point is is that it's still a lot to manage. Tom, by no means, is a hobbyist, especially with his background. He's done, he, he's, he's contributed a great amount to the county that he lives in, as well as the state. And to listen to him each week talk about what he's experiencing is just horrible. But this is what is going on, and I am grateful that Tom is talking about it because it's something that more people need to listen to. I remember many years ago when I first launched this show, there were a lot of hobbyist beekeepers who felt that, well, the neonicotinoid problem is only something that affects agriculture, and it's not. 
it's something that is ubiquitous. We're seeing evidence from home garden environments where people are using different products and they can't get butterflies in their gardens regardless of what they plant. The soil is just not healthy enough for butterflies to thrive. And the same thing with the bees. Only with agriculture, the honeybee is an animal that is needed to pollinate so many of the different crops that we depend upon. Now, speaking of which, Tom, especially since it's Thanksgiving, let's take a moment and just remind our listeners exactly what types of crops are pollinated by honeybees, and especially the ones that they enjoy each Thanksgiving. Well, let's start with the crops that aren't pollinated by honeybees, and there are other pollinators, native bees, in relatively small numbers, but let's start with the crops that aren't pollinated, and that would be the grain crops primarily, corn, wheat, oats, barley, uh, rice, rice is another one, all of these are wind pollinated. So you would have those sorts of uh, food in your diet, but the bees are responsible for the cross-pollination of all the good stuff. The fruits and the berries, everything with color and taste, and you might sit down to a Thanksgiving dinner of cornbread. I'm overstating it, obviously, but take a look at your Thanksgiving table when you sit down with your friends and relatives and just visualize what that table would look like if we removed all those foods that are de dependent either directly or indirectly on pollination. Take away the pumpkin pie. Take away the cranberry sauce. Take away the turkey. Take away the turkey, yeah. The turkey is fed on a lot of those things that are insect pollinated. These pollinating insects are at the base of the food chain. And they're simply the indicator species, and that's one of the reasons why we're so concerned. As important as the bees are, and certainly to someone who's spent their life as a beekeeper, they really are just representative of the damage that's going on to almost all life forms at the lower end of the food chain. The soil organisms, the microbes, the earthworms, the freshwater invertebrates, and it's beginning to to work its way up the food chain. It's beginning to affect the fish population because it's impoverished their diet. It's had dramatic effects on the bird population nationally. This is a very, very serious e ecological disaster and it's getting none of the attention that it deserves. Tom, I just want to take a minute and talk about life back when the pilgrims first arrived. They were the ones who brought the honeybees to America. What they had experienced was great starvation. And because of the introduction of honeybees, they knew that they could grow certain crops in order to store them throughout the winter and survive. And just think about the whole concept of Thanksgiving, giving thanks for the abundance that they were experiencing. Now, it's interesting, one of the arguments is that neonicotinoid pesticides are necessary in agriculture in order for the crops to thrive. And if you just take a look at what the pilgrims did, they were proof that these pesticides are not necessary in order to thrive. Well, what we found, and we've talked about this before on this program, uh, the research is showing that in, in about 90% of the cases, the neonicotinoids have no positive effect on yields or the survival of the plants. In 90% of the cases, in other words, in 90% of the cases, this is simply an expensive crop insurance. And if you take a look at the remaining 10%, uh, we talked about it last week, there are instances where the fact that seed has been treated with the neonicotinoids has suppressed the predator population of some uh, pest insect. And the most recent example was the slugs 
and soybeans. The neonicotinoids kill off the slugs, or kill off the uh, predator of the slugs, a beetle, but don't affect the slugs. So what you get is you get an in increase in the population of slugs, which affects the crop, uh, the production of soybeans, and reduces the crop by about 5%. So, you know, <laughs> it's something we call shooting yourself in the foot. The farmers have been sold a bill of goods in many cases, and they've been convinced that they need to have these prophylactic systemic chemicals to raise a crop when, were they given better counsel, they would recognize that they're being taken. Tom, it's interesting that you're making this point because when you take a look at the big picture, the ones that truly benefit from these pesticides is really industry. By design, neonicotinoids were created to kill. And for industry to deny that is, it's outrageous. Our first story, which is from the Associated Press, and it's titled, Pesticide Makers Point to Other Culprits in Bee Die-Offs. What's interesting is that this article does exactly what we expect of mainstream media, who is dependent upon advertising dollars from companies such as Bayer, to basically flip-flop and not do anything to really support or advocate on behalf of the bees. It points out basically what everybody else does. So I don't know if they're just looking to get a little bit of extra traffic about this subject from people that are concerned about the bees or whatnot. But the bottom line is, is that mainstream media has been part of the problem. They won't take a position one way or the other. And we've seen this time and time again. Well, mainstream media in large part is part of the oligarchy. Many of the media outlets are owned by the very mega corporations that we talk about on this program and uh, it, and it's also I think uh, an example of lazy journalism there's very little true investigative reporting that's going on anymore there are a few who distinguish themselves but it's just much too easy for a, a busy writer to take what's handed to them by the corporations propaganda pieces and integrate a little criticism with that and just put it out and fill the space. We could be well served by some very serious investigative reporting here because this is a, a perhaps the biggest environmental story of our time. And even though we've been talking about it now for five years, it's still being overlooked and avoided and glossed over and... Uh, the uh, crisis is looming. The crisis is here. Well, Tom, last week we talked about some of the terms that people can look for when they see what we've often referred to as PR pieces for industry. And one of the key terms to look for is the phrase, or is the, the term, one of the key terms to look for is colony collapse disorder, which is something that, once again, this article mentions. And it basically says, quote, researchers suspect neonic pesticides play some role in reported die-offs and the mysterious colony collapse disorder, but they don't know how much. Well, this is tri part of the fiction that the uh, chemical industry is trying to keep going. And that is that this is a multifactorial problem, and it is. I wouldn't argue with that. There are many uh, things that bees are susceptible to. And that it's a great unsolved mystery. And you mentioned the colony collapse disorder. That term was uh, captured by the chemical industry very early in the discussions. And certainly colonies do collapse. But that's simply one of many symptoms of poisoning by the systemic pesticides. It's certainly not a disorder. It's not this great black hole that's going to require years of research and millions of dollars. There's no lack of science to show us what's going on here, and it's clear that the environment is being massively poisoned by these systemic pesticides. And 
anyone who does any investigation whatsoever can very quickly see the deceptions and the excuses and the evasions. It's not that hard. It's pretty transparent. Well, I think it's kind of interesting that the article mentions a student who thought it was kind of odd to see bottles of Bayer's pesticides on display. And, I mean, a student is is recognizing that there's something very wrong with this whole picture that industry is presenting as, no, everything's fine. So it, it's really up to people to take it upon themselves to take a closer look at what they're hearing about this decline. And if you're being told by a company that is a manufacturer of pesticides that, no, we, we're not doing anything to hurt the bees, come on, they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar, basically, and they're trying to avoid accountability for it. How much longer will we allow this to continue? That's what remains. You're seeing it with your bees. So many people are writing in to talk about what they're experiencing and how tragic it is. I mean, it doesn't make me feel good to read these emails and to see these comments one after the other after the other every week. I have over 90,000 emails in my inbox. It's, it's crazy. I'll, uh, I'll tell just a little personal story. A year ago, I had a, a call from a fellow in Sacramento, California, and he's been a honey customer for many years, and every year or so he would call me up or drop me a note and ask me to send him a case of honey. Well, in 2014, I had virtually no honey crop at all, and George called and wanted to order his regular case of honey, and I said, George, I don't have it. I just don't have it to send to you, and I said, I'm going to keep trying to keep the business alive, and maybe next year we will have a crop. Just be patient. He said, well, Tom, I don't know how much time I have left. I said, well, how old are you, George? 94. Uh, it's heartbreaking. It's not just the loss of the bees. It's the loss of all these human connections that go along with a business like mine. Fortunately, I did have a small crop this year, enough that I can send a case to George, and I feel much better about that, but it really doesn't change the overall picture of, of what we're up against. For small business owners such as yourself, your business was something that was not only enjoyable, but to a certain degree, it was worth all of the extra steps that you went through because you knew that you would be able to provide a much-needed product that people depended upon. And now, what's the direction? Are people just going to import honey from other places where they don't have that rapport where they don't know their customers where you basically you're just ordering something from some unknown place just to fulfill a requirement it may not be even even be available from overseas because this is a global problem these mega corporations are trying to enforce the same sort of agricultural production in other countries just as they are in the united states and the Problems that the bees are having in the United States are not limited to the United States. We're seeing the same problems in Europe, in Africa, in Australia, in New Zealand. On every continent where these neonicotinoids have been introduced, we're seeing these kinds of casualties. And there may be very few of these commodities available, or at least available on a much smaller scale because of what's been done. Which actually leads us to our next topic, which is a new study has shown a strong relationship between the decline of common and widespread British butterflies and the increasing use of neonicotinoid pesticides on arable crops. What that, I think, points up is that we have found these systemic pesticides and the consequences of their presence almost everywhere we have looked. Now, the EPA and the USDA are being very careful not to look, but the U.S. Geological Survey has found the neonicotinoids in the water, in the soil, in non-target plants, 
we're now seeing the effect on bumblebees, on native pollinators, on butterflies and moths. Uh, it, this is a, a problem that we need to give much more serious attention than we have and stop being led by the nose by these mega corporations. People need to begin to educate themselves and take action. Now this study was a collaboration between the University of Sterling Biological Records Center, Butterfly Conservation, and the University of Sussex. They examined 17 species of widespread butterflies over the last 30 years. The declines of 15 were correlated to the area of the UK subject to treatment with neonicotinoid pesticides. So this is, this is not just one particular person or a small group of scientists. This is a pretty fairly decent collaboration. And one of the things that it mentions in the abstract is the fact that in the Netherlands, declines in insectivorous birds are positively associated with levels of neonicotinoid pollution in surface water, which ties back into what you were saying about the, the water, Tom. Well, we're finding it everywhere, and there have been virtually hundreds and hundreds of scientific studies that have shown the connection between these systemic pesticides and the environmental damage. And it's an interesting little exercise to take a few of these and compare them to the scientific studies that the chemical industry puts forth, it's an embarrassment because it's quite literally junk science. It's poorly designed. They draw conclusions from evidence that they don't have. And it's very clear what's going on here. And it's very clear that uh, the government has taken no action. The EPA has taken no action. The USD has taken no action. They're all at the trough. I think this research, which is actually, it's been published in Pure J, really is important as far as their conclusion, which states that neonicotinoids may explain the concurrent rapid decline in butterfly populations. And it says species such as the wall brown, small skipper, and small tortoise shell appear to have been particularly heavily impacted. Butterflies are key pollinators. Folks, the reason that they call butterflies and bees indicator species is because they're an indication of what is happening in the environment in that particular area. And if you're talking about global declines, as Tom pointed out, it's ubiquitous. It's not in just one particular region. It is a global problem. It is, and... Uh... What was found in the UK with the butterflies and the moths it, it confirms something that's been going on here in the United States. We're seeing some of the same problems here in the United States with what were once very common bumblebee species that are either on or on the verge of being put on the endangered species list. And this is the passenger pigeon all over again. A little less obvious, but perhaps irrevocable. The last article that we'd like to talk about is in regards to Quebec's actions. Quebec is imposing strict regulations on pesticides that are known to kill bees. Neonicotinoids have been banned in the European Union since 2013. However, the UK suspended the ban in July, and Quebec joins Ontario as two Canadian provinces that have forbidden the product. So this is a huge victory. Every time you have a major region that bans these chemicals, it's a huge victory. It's also sending a message to industry that this is an area that they will not be increasing their market share. Quebec and Ontario are similar from an agricultural standpoint to the United States, and they have taken a refreshingly insightful look at the systemic pesticides, and they have acted upon what they have found. It's a stark contrast to what we're seeing here in the United States, where the efforts have been to sweep it under the rug, to not talk about it, to do nothing, or to do things that have little or no effect and don't interfere with the interests of the chemical industry. Well, I think it's a great effort by Quebec to take a stand against industry and to take a stand for the environment as well as pollinators. 
So way to go, yeah, Quebec. Quebec is following the lead of Ontario. Ontario has done a lot of the footwork in this, and uh, both those provinces are are acting responsibly and trying to deal with these environmental problems. Well, I think it's great the Ontario Beekeepers Association has such tremendous leadership under Tibor Zabo, who's been on the show numerous times. And he's the son of a well-respected scientist. And it's just great to see so many changes that are positive taking place in the areas. Even as progressive as Ontario has been, though, the chemical industry has managed to co-opt a certain segment of the beekeeping community and get them to speak out against these kinds of restrictions. And we're seeing the same thing in the United States. The uh, the corporate interests used their money to lubricate their point of view, and we're seeing the same thing here in the United States. We have, despite the problems, huge, huge losses. We have beekeepers and beekeepers groups who would tell you that neonicotinoids are no problem whatsoever. Well, as you've said to me many times, Tom, either they're being paid or they're stupid, and hopefully it's that they're being paid, because if they're that stupid, the article that the Associated Press published had a kid that knew that there was something off. So you would think somebody who is a beekeeper would have a more in-depth understanding of the impact. And that would be very sad if that particular person didn't, which seems to be the case in a number of areas, especially in parts of America. But in any event, it, I think it's it's great progress. On that note, Tom, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for helping to advocate for the protection of not only our honeybees, but for all of our pollinators. I appreciate all of your help and your advice and your friendship over the years, especially with the neonicotinoid view. Well, thank you, Joan, and I really appreciate the efforts that you go to to give us an outlet for these kinds of views and these sorts of discussions. I think it's very important, and uh, I hope you have a good Thanksgiving as well. Thank you. And, folks, please tune in next week as Tom and I continue to explore the impact of neonicotinoids on the environment. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a happy Thanksgiving, and have a great afternoon.